All right, we're going to get ready and get started for the, uh, the next two speakers. Um, if you guys weren't joining us with the last session, we are having a ECMO uh, sim lab, uh, wet, wet lab uh, tomorrow at 1225. We'll do some circuit change outs and stuff like that. And here we'll have four consoles, the Centromag and the Cardio, and we'll do some troubleshooting issues and stuff like that. So for our next uh, speaker will be Cliff. Um, and all right. <clears throat> okay. Um, my name is Clifton Marshall. I currently work at UC Davis Medical Center. Prior to that, I worked at Stanford. And prior to that, I worked at a small contract group. Um, so from an ECMO standpoint, uh, I've seen kind of small facilities to very robust to now I'm at a very overly protocolized um, facility. Uh, so when John asked me to do this uh, presentation, I initially started talking about management strategies and cannulation, different situations of that. But then I kind of took a step back and was wondering what I'd really want to know uh, as I started to go into these new programs and different situations. And what I found was it was the uh, initiation and termination. I had same, similar questions always being asked that I couldn't quite answer. And so that's what I kind of wanted to focus on through this. And that would be the initiation to, to weaning, not so much the management. And uh, hopefully you can get a couple more tools for the tool bag. So just getting started here. Um, I feel like there's five phases to an initiation. The most important is always your pre-setup, how you're gonna set up your pump, how, where it's gonna be, where your supplies are. And then after that, you're gonna go through a chart review. Then you're gonna talk cannulation strategy, bring your equipment to the room, and then launch or go on to ECMO, okay? So we'll start out with very basic things and then kind of move through those fast, and then we'll get into a little bit more complex things. So circuit design, if you are at a small facility, I kind of recommend that you just use the in and out. At my first facility, we had, uh, this was the contract group, we only did about one to two ECMOs a year. And we had a, basically a box that we had all of our equipment in. And if we were gonna do an ECMO, we had to piece it all together. It was actually uh, probably one of the most nerve wracking situations uh, because you are building the pump, then priming it, and then you had to be getting, getting ready to go on. So there was a lot more extra steps involved. Uh, so checklists were very beneficial and um, different things of that. So here I have the basics that you need with any circuit. It'll be your inflow, outflow cannula, you know, your oxygenator and your drive motor. Um, I think that's pretty much basic now to have pre and posts uh, and a negative pressure so that you can do any sort of emergency management towards it. But that doesn't mean that I haven't seen uh, ECMOs come in without that on there. Uh, you can also do extras. You can have, you know, uh, different pressure monitors. You could have a bridge in line. You could have inlet gas monitoring. But with everything that you add, it's, it's a paradox to your, to your ECMO circuit. Um, so in an ideal situation, you'd have no connections whatsoever, right? And then you would have less hemolysis, you'd have less um, turbulence flow, and then you'd, you'd eventually have less access to it. So that's a benefit from the hemolysis standpoint, but then you can't get into your circuit. So there's always the paradox or the con of being able to do you want to access your circuit? Do you want to be able to monitor, right? So each facility that you go to, you're going to have to figure out what you exactly want. And you may not be able to make these decisions on your own. Um, but if you have an ability to have a conversation or you're starting a program, uh, it's something to think about. Uh, I work right now at UC Davis. We do peds and we do adults. And we have two completely different circuit setups based on the patient population that we're dealing with. Uh, our PED circuits always come with a bridge. Uh, we have all the bells and whistles on it because we want to be able to monitor these patients really tightly. But then on our adult side, we actually just have a one loop in and out with the cardio help. So uh, I just wanted to stress the point of the paradox between monitoring and uh, benefit to the patient. Okay, uh, I just highlighted the cardio help because that's what we use. They do a good job of basically putting the centrifugal head butted up right next to the oxygenator, reducing your hema dilution that you'll have from the patient. Also, they have a pre-post uh, port that is under positive pressure, which is a big deal. So if you're not watching it, let's say you have nursing watching it, that's how our facility is. Uh, if you open one of those stopcocks, you won't deprime your circuit instantly. It'll have bleed out. You just gotta turn it off before you sanguinate your patient. But that's a far easier management than uh, trying to reprime a circuit. Uh, the con would obviously access the venous side and cost because it's very expensive and you can't replace a centrifugal head versus an oxygenator. 
<clears throat> so kind of going through pre-setup a little bit more. Um, do you prime a circuit and have it sitting there? Do you have a dry setup and have it sitting there? Uh, I think that has a lot to do with the volume that you're dealing with at your facility. Like I told you, the first facility I was at was extremely small, and we only had uh, a box of parts that we had to put together. Don't really recommend that. I would say at least have a dry setup ready for you so that when you are coming in or you are dealing with it post-cardiac cardiac, uh, bypass, you have it all ready for you. Um, but if you're a large center at UC Davis and at Stanford, we always had two primed circuits because we go through them so quickly. We had one for uh, different locations, basically, one in the cath lab versus one in um, the Wolfer, the ORs. Um, the other thing that you need to consider is, is looking at your bag or your cart. You know, uh, there's been too many times where I've gone to put on someone on ECMO in a different unit and you just don't have all the supplies that you need. And you have to think of it from three different standpoints. You have to think of it from your surgical team, what they're gonna bring, what you need to bring, and any modifications that you need to bring. And again, that's something that you're just gonna have to look into in your facility, what is necessary and what is not necessary. But I mean, an easy way to do this is every time you don't have something, you might wanna consider adding that and putting it on a checklist so that's there the next time. Uh, it's, it's usually really hard after uh, ECMO initiation to get yourself to go and restock everything and then on top of that add anything that may have been missing to the to the protocol for the next time but it really is beneficial if you just slowly piece things together and it gets better every time that you're going through it um, and then uh, yeah checklist 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 so at, at UC Davis I think this year they got a uh, platinum award for ELSO I think they're one two in the country and a lot of that was due to the the amount of uh, checklists they made. They made the checklist for perfusionists, that's pretty standard. But we also had them for RNs, we had them for physicians. And as we were going through uh, whatever the scenario it would be, we had uh, VA versus VV versus emergency management. It's all on like a little ring put on the ECMO pump that you could just walk through. And it was really beneficial, uh, especially because I don't know if you can see one of those top ones is called the perfusionist because that was forgotten several times. <laughs> Um, so then let's say you're getting called in, right? Uh, you, what happens for me, I get called in, I'll ask for the MRN number so I can look up what the patient is and what uh, is going on. You look up the etiology, height, weight, BSA, uh, that helps you find out your flow and your cannula. Uh, crit, just in case you need a blood prime. I don't know if everyone does that, but it is an option. And then special circumstances, vascular access or hit or something of that matter. Um, this just helps you be more prepared, right? So when you talk to your surgeon or whatnot, you'd be able to know exactly what's going on prior to him telling you what to do. Uh, and so uh, a young Cliff, uh, this is pre-perfusionist. I used to know what ECMO was because I worked as a physical therapy in a hospital. And uh, I used to think, why doesn't everyone put everyone on VA ECMO? I just couldn't understand why you'd ever do VV considering a lot of times you'd convert VV to VA. And uh, as I went to perfusion school, I realized this is Harlequin syndrome, okay? So uh, this is something that is beaten into you in perfusion school, I feel, over and over again. And uh, it's something that is important and you need to learn, and that's why we don't have everyone on VA ECMO. Uh, it's also known as mixing cloud or dual circulations or north-southing, but it's all the same thing. And it's essentially competing flows. So if you have an anagrade flow coming from your heart, uh, you can see it here, I guess, in, in blue because it's deoxygenated at this point. And you have a retrograde flow coming from your femoral cannula coming up. Then you're going to have competing flows. And wherever that mixing cloud between the two meets is where the flows of each will be. So if you have deoxygenated blood coming from your lungs, let's say, and it is, you have a strong heart and it overpowers the retrograde flow of your femoral cannula, then you will have deoxygenated blood going to your head vessels, right? So you can't have that. Deoxygenated blood to the brain is never good. So that's why we have to look up the etiology and know if we're going VV or VA. So in short, VV ECMO is going to be anything that's dealing with the lungs. So your ARDS, you're going to have pulmonary embolism, asthma, airway obstruction, those things. Uh, obviously, bridge to transplant too. Uh, that'll be the same with cardiac. And then VA is going to be anything like acute myocarditis, uh, cardiomyopathies, low output syndrome, failure to wean from bypass. So heart things. Um, and uh, the, there's only one real contraindication for ECMO, and that would be uh, successful outcomes a year after ECMO. Uh, and 
basically, you don't want to put anyone on who has a stroke prior. You don't want to put anyone on who has a cancer that's un unable to be fixed. Uh, it's just you wouldn't want to put all your time and effort into a patient that is, in is inevitably going to pass. Uh, you have relative in contraindications, which are CPR for over an hour, uh, your age, uncontrolled bleeding. These are things just think about when you are uh, putting someone on ECMO. Uh, at Stanford, the residents put people on ECMO a lot. So knowing these contraindications and indications uh, kind of is helpful for them because they're not that uh, used to putting people on all the time, especially when they're brand new into it. And so giving them a little help and saying, hey, maybe this isn't the best patient or not uh, kind of can be a helpful situation. Okay, so then we get into our strategy, right? So we're talking to the surgeon now. <laughs> Um, when we talk to the surgeon, we want to know cannulation strategy. We want to know our target flow. We need to know if it's a vent, an impella being put on afterwards. Uh, this is where we're going to get all our information prior to getting to the room to get everything done. Uh, it feels really good to have this conversation with the surgeon and be able to walk in and say, hey, we have a, a patient with um, failure to wean or whatever, and you can walk in and say, well, I have a 20 and a 25 French you know, arterial, arterial venous cannula, and I have a distal perfuser ready for you if you want it. Uh, knowing what you're gonna do and then being able to talk to the surgeon gives confidence in both people and it makes the, the whole thing a lot smoother too. So um, just real quick, I know that the next presenter is gonna talk about cannulation strategy and the management of it, but I wanna talk about uh, basically uh, what you would need for the initiation in each cannulation strategy. Uh, just a quick overview, this, there's classic two site, which will be your femoral and your IJ. Then there's the new dual lumen cannulas, which will be like an Avalon or a Crescent cannula. Uh, and that's a one site that you usually put through your IJ, and then it goes into the right atrium. And then you have a, a double femoral, which would be um, a multi-stage femoral cannula that's lowerly placed. And then you have a single stage femoral cannula that would be placed a little bit higher. Uh, and that we, for some reason at Stanford, we use that quite a bit for our COVID patients. They said we could flow higher. Uh, debatable if that was just because of recirculation though. But. Um, and then for VA, we have uh, FemFem. I'd say 95% of the VA uh, ECMOs I've done have been FemFem, and that's why Harlequin syndrome and, uh, or North-Southing, whatever you call it, is so prevalent. Uh, you would use central pretty much after your post-cardiotomy uh, or post-cardiac uh, bypass surgeries. And then there's also, you can do an axillary surgery uh, or axillary cannulation uh, with a femoral venous. So just showing you different ways that they can be cannulated and you should have a conversation with your surgeon so you know. Uh, this is kind of some funky stuff, but I feel oh, like at Stanford, I've done one of any of these at some point, uh, double circulations, adding a venous cannula, adding an arterial cannula, BAV, whatever it may be. I wanna uh, stop and talk about uh, the outflow cannula and the inflow cannula a little bit because when I was fresh out of school, I, I looked at it and I knew that you needed a pressure drop of less than 100. That was all that I really knew. I could read a graph. You look at it and you say, okay, hey, we have a pressure drop of 100 at this cannula at five liters. I know that I need this to flow five liters. That's where we'll land. Um, but new research is basically coming out showing that at 100, a pressure drop of 100, it causes hemolysis. But at a pressure drop of 80, you're also getting hemolysis. It's not just all of a sudden it starts at 100. So at, being able to big, use a bigger lumen cannula is important. And so in, at UC Davis with our, our COVID patients, we started doing this. For our VV ECMOs, we'd put in a, a 25 IJ cannula just to reduce the hemolysis. And, and initially there was a lot of pushback from it because they're saying, oh, that French size is too huge. But if you think about your dual lumen cannulas, they're 32 French, that's even bigger. So you can put a big cannula in there and reduce that hemolysis. And, and it does seem to help quite a bit. Um, just kind of backtracking, I, I went through it too fast. I know Gravely said that uh, adult flow on ECMO, uh, I read it in the book before I came here, uh, said it was 100 milliliters per kilogram, and that's just too much. I'm 75 kilograms, uh, so that would mean I'd have to flow 7.5 liters for me, and I just, I don't think that's correct. If you look at the clinical perfusion manual, it says 60 to 80 milliliters per kilogram, which would put me between 5.5 liters and uh, 6 liters. So that makes a lot more sense. Uh, but pediatrics and adults is gonna be different. And so uh, when you're trying to find your target flow, these are the, the values that we use at uh, UC Davis. 
Um, going on to the Venus cannula, this was also quite an irritation for me after perfusion school. Uh, you knew on the adults or on the arterial side that you needed a pressure drop of less than 100, right? But on the Venus side, if you go up to 100 here, it says that my 19 French cannula can flow four liters, which I just know is not the case that's going to happen. So how do you know exactly what cannula size to use for this, right? If you're looking at this flow chart, well, uh, the clinical perfusion manual says between 35 and 40, I think, is your pressure drop that you want. And that really lands to what the cannula can actually flow through to. Uh, obviously, you're going to have issues with vas vascular, uh, not access, but drainage, depending on the patient's anatomy, different things of that matter are going to uh, hinder your flow. But it all hinders your flow, right? Um, it's never going to be perfect in, in these uh, flow graphs. So like, my, my recommendation would be just look at 35 to 40 milliliters, and you'll know that you could probably flow around there. And if you're not flowing around there, there's one of two scenarios happening. You have an issue with the cannula position, or you're going to have some sort of vasculature issue, and you'll have to reassess. Uh, and this is the dual lumen cannulas. I thought it was really interesting that they just they put both of them on there for you and uh, allow you to see where, where you should be. Um, so OK, we, get it, we talk to the surgeon. We go get all our equipment. We bring it all in. Everything seems to be uh, copacetic at this point. And then we're going to get ready to go on bypass. So at this point, heparin goes in. Uh, what I do personally is I retest everything. I, I look through uh, all my zeros, making sure everything's zeroed. I make sure anything's powered that needs to be powered. I need to make sure the water is warm that needs to be warmed. But then you kind of wait after you have everything set up that you need, right? Um, and and what I've found is, is you can sit there and wait and just wait for being told what to do, or you can be actively involved in the cannulation process. So knowing what your surgeon wants and needs is, is, is very beneficial, not only to uh, make a emergent situation usually smoother, but it, it also uh, is just less frustrating in general for the both of you. You won't be getting yelled at as much. Uh, so I kind of want to talk about just the... Uh, the cannulation process for each of the ones that we just talked about and go through it a little bit because this was something I didn't really know coming out of perfusion school and it was really helpful to understand uh, because I was able to hand up wires and hand up scenarios uh, or different things in different scenarios as needed. So uh, just talking about the femoral cannulation, we're just, they do a percutaneous cannula usually at uh, UC Davis. That doesn't mean you can't do a cut down, but it's a very similar uh, situation that you do. Uh, so you put the needle in, and once you put the needle in, you'll put in a sl small glide wire. You pull out the needle, holding pressure. After that, you're usually going to put some sort of sheath over that needle, okay? Once you take that sheath out, then we can start cannulating up. Um, at, UC, at UC Davis, we've changed to this way, which is also now the Stanford way of, of cannulating. But you have a sheath in there and you want to get, extend that wire all the way to the top. We use a glide wire because it has a glypophilic head. So as it goes through the vessel, it drags along, and it won't actually puncture through the vessel, OK? You don't use a stiff wire in that moment because you don't want it actually to puncture through. Uh, after you use the glide wire and get it up there, you exchange it with a, or you put a ca glide cath, and you exchange it for a stiffer wire. If you do not exchange it for a stiffer wire, and this just happened to me literally three weeks ago, a surgeon did not exchange it and tried to put the cannula up with a uh, put the cannula up with a glide wire. It kinks immediately, and they say they're meeting resistance and they're meeting resistance, and you don't know why. And eventually, you realize they're not using a stiff enough wire. So if you see that happen, you can help out. You can say, "Hey, we're going to have to exchange everything out." If they do kink that wire, you're going to need a new wire. You can't can't do it over again. So you put the stiff wire in. You dilate up. Um, when you have an IJ cannula, one of my pet peeves is if you do not extend the tubing line. If you, <laughs> if you put a femoral cannula here and an IJ here, the way that the circuit usually works is you have the same amount of tubing, right? If you do not extend the extra tubing to the top, then you're going to have a venous side tubing that's just extremely long and one that's really tight. So extending tubing and realizing the situation that you're going through is, is super beneficial, especially in... in uh, the back end when you're trying to do a CT trip or you're just trying to move the circuit around. Um, and so that's true with the dual lumen. You have the one on the side. You're going to need uh, dilators that are bigger because usually we use about a 30 to 32 French uh, crescent Avalon cannula, whatever it may be. 
And so you'll need to get a dilator kit that goes up that high. And then uh, obviously extra tubing because it's up in the IJ and you don't want to be too tight again. Femoral can the double femoral, you got to make sure that you have one multi-stage and one single port. Because if you have two multi-stage cannulas, they're just transferring blood back and forth at a low level and it's doing nothing for your patient really. Um, and then an axillary, uh, just to highlight this real quick, I don't know how many people have put axillary uh, patients on ECMO. But uh, there's three different ways you can do it. Essentially, you can do a percutaneous, like, uh, not percutaneous, you could do a, a tunnel graph. And so the majority of the graph is underneath the skin, or you can have it hanging out. Uh, if it's, the graph is hanging out, then you can put just a connector on the end, or you can put a cannula all the way in it. So knowing your strategy is important. Uh, just knowing the, the differences between them. Uh, it, a lot of people do the tunneling so that there's not any oozing around the graph site. But in that case, a lot of times what will happen is you'll have clots slowly building around it. And as it blow, builds around it and builds around it, your pressures will go up and you'll lose flow. And then you'll have to open that up. That's the deficit of it. Uh, if you don't put it, uh, if you do not tunnel the graph and you have it wide open, it just oozes and bleeds there. That's one of the issues for there. And then so what people try to do is they'll put a cannula in the graph. So that stops any of that extra uh, volume being in the graph and being able to ooze out. But the deficit there would be you have to watch out if the cannula pushes too deep and then it occludes your uh, arms distally or uh, whatnot. And you can see that pretty obviously with uh, a radial art line or some sort of uh, pull socks on that finger. But uh, all things to watch out for, for your cannulation needs. And I, I say that because I have seen those all happen. Okay, and then um, just quick, this is how I go on, on bypass, or not bypass, ECMO. Um, so when he says hand up lines, I clamp out my circuit. I think it's important to control your own, your own circuit. If you don't, a lot of times they'll have it clamped up there. I hear perfusionists say that in the past. Uh, oh, they have it clamped, I don't have to clamp mine. Yeah, well, the clamp often moves. You know, they want a little length, less length, they want a little more length, they just don't want the clamp where it is, they don't like it, whatever it is. If they open that clamp and you deprime your circuit, uh, that's, that's a big issue, especially in an emergent situation. So control your own circuit. Uh, once you hand up lines, um, make sure the lines are long enough, again, because uh, you're gonna try to probably move that patient afterwards, and if you can't do that, it'll be not fun for you. Um, I turn up my RPMs, because you don't want retrograde flow as you go on. And then I turn on my gas also because you don't want to uh, send deoxygenated blood. As they are cannulating, I check to make sure that there's no air because a lot of times as they're trying to put it together, they might have the cap off or untightened and a little bubble comes back or whatnot. And you might be able to see it better than them in your position. And then tubing orientation, always really big. Um, you don't want to flip them back and forth. Uh, so as you, they say go on, uh, I open both the venous and the arterial clamp. I watch the venous cannula, and this is important because it not only allows you to see if there's air and clot coming back, but it allows you to make sure that you're in the correct direction, right? If you're watching that venous cannula and you don't see anything coming back from it, then where, where's it going, right? So if you look over to the arterial and you see it pulling back, you can just clamp off. Any issues, clamp off. Uh, the other, then once you uh, are watching your venous cannula and you assume that everything is okay, then you can start coming up on flow. As you're coming up on flow, I watch my negatives, and then I kind of go back and forth between my arterial pressure. Um, I'm looking at my negatives to make sure we're not chugging or anything. I'm looking at my arterial pressure to make sure it's not excessively high. I had a case one time that as I went on, the pressure was about 295, but I was only flowing about 2.5. This cannula, usually I could, fly, I could flow about five liters. I'm telling the surgeon this, he doesn't like it. He's telling me to go up. I go up. I keep going up on my RPMs, pressure keeps going higher. All of a sudden, my pressure's 500 and my flow is 1.5. And said, I, I don't know what to tell you, but I cannot flow. Dissected the vessel out. This was during compressions. This was during an issue, like uh, an emergent situation. We had to recannulate a different area. So understanding the scenario does matter. And, and being able to put your foot down does matter. Um, that was young in my career. I was probably six to eight months at Stanford at that point in time, and uh, I did not make that mistake ever again. <laughs> uh, just showing normal versus a normal cannulation strategy or uh, going on bypass. One shows high negatives and zero flow, and the other one just kind of shows a, a rough outline of what it should look like when you're going on. Uh, that would be probably the most ideal scenario that I could think of. Uh, not always the case.
Um, just a couple things to think about after initiation with VV versus VA. Uh, I check for recirculation in both, except it's in a different way. Uh, uh, for VV, when you're checking for recirculation, if you, let's say you have a SAT of 90, but maybe you don't have SATs, maybe you just have a very red color, um, you, you need to make sure that the cannulas are positioned correctly. And, and that's a pretty easy one, but if, if in VA ECMO, you have recirculation, let's say you both have red blood just coming in and out, that's a bigger issue. That usually means that they cannulated the vein uh, rather than the art artery, which does happen. And so if you can identify that quick enough, the patient won't suffer from it. But if you don't identify it fast enough, uh, the patient could die. And uh, this happened several times, again, at, at Stanford, just because uh, we have an eCPR program there. So we're trying to do everything rushed. And when we put someone on, it did not go well. Uh, but we were able to identify it. And so compressions continued, and we recannulated around. Um, another thing with VV ECMO I, I see very often is when we get a pre-post oxygenator gas right after we go on to make sure that the oxygenator is functioning, the uh, physicians try to titrate to it. And that is not the patient's gas. That's your gas, right? So you don't want to titrate to that whatsoever. Uh, you have to watch out for it. And they'll be very confident when they tell you to titrate for it. So uh, something to watch out for. And then I, I wrote hypotension down here. Because on VV ECMO, it seems like every time you go on, you're going to have some sort of hypotension. Uh, it's the hemodilution of the catecholamines or whatnot. Uh, but on the other end, VA, you don't know what you're going to see. Uh, in these emergency situations, usually we're giving lots of epi and calcium and norepi and whatever it may be. And right when you start that circulation process up on VA ECMO, you actually skyrocket your pressure because all, that blood, all, that, all those drugs start circulating. So you should be, you should be prepared for it. Uh, while it could also be the opposite where maybe he was just... Uh, he was functioning, but not functioning well enough, so he might go hypotension. So watching your hemodynamics right after you go on is, is important. Sometimes they'll have you push fluids through the back of your oxygenator, or you'll have uh, to uh, add FFP or whatever it may be. Uh, and then for VA ECMO, another thing to look at, if you're not putting a distal perfuser in, you, you should really check for foot pulses to make sure that you don't have any sort of leg ischemia. Uh, it's one of the biggest issues with VA ECMOs not using when you're not using a distal perfuser. Uh, and then just a couple simple things on the end. Uh, alarm settings, you gotta make sure you check your alarms, convert everything to wall glass, and then fluid management. So just some things to think about. Uh, this is management. I'm gonna let the next presenter talk about it a little bit more. Uh, this is gonna make me go through all this. Cool. And so now we'll, we'll kind of zoom through that as uh, the next presenter will talk about management, but I just want to talk about the weaning process of VV ECMO, um, which is much simpler than the VA ECMO. Um, one of the, the things that happens at UC Davis all the time is we start weaning, and they'll take a gas at 90% at FiO2 and then 80% FiO2 and then 70% FiO2. And uh, that's not that big of an issue with adult patients, but uh, with our pediatric patients, that's a lot of blood that we're losing per uh, patient or per situation. So uh, I've kind of brought this uh, oxygen dissociation curve up just so you, that you can realize when you're running your VV ECMOs, usually your post oxy gas is around 400, right? You have a PO2 of 400. If you bring that down to 70%, your PO2, let's say, is now 120. You're still satting 100%, right? And we learned in the physiology. Uh, the physiology talk right before this, that the majority of your oxygen carrying capacity is through the blood cells and your saturation. So that amount of, of, of movement that you made from 100 to 70 is almost nothing. So rather than slowly tearing the beginning, we actually go straight to 70%. And then in the middle portion where you see the steepness of the curve here, we actually go really slow. Uh, and, and it's just something to conserve a little bit of blood and save you a little bit of time and hassle. But it is something to... Uh, uh, think about as you are weaning off. Um, at UC Davis and Stanford, it was pretty typical. We just kind of go down integrally as we take our blood gases. And then after 24 hours of no sweep, that was when we knew that it was okay to come off ECMO. Um, for VA, it's a little bit more complicated because as you come down on flow, not sweep, you uh, run the risk of clotting off, right? So, so there's two different strategies to handle this. Uh, I'm sure there's actually far more strategies, but they're all based in the same scenarios of uh, how you do it. 
Uh, I just kind of put a little note echoing for an EF is not full, uh, is not accurate. I just thought that's something that people should know. Uh, a lot of times I'll have people come up to me right after they go on ECMO and say, hey, uh, the, uh, the EF is only 10% now. And you're like, yes, I understand that. It's, we're on ECMO. You have to fill the heart to have anything happen. Um, and so if they're saying they're not ready because of this, I, sometimes it's helpful to just give a little like, well, you know, they're on ECMO. That makes sense to push them along in the right direction. <clears throat> uh, so coming down from, from the ECMO, it's just a gradual wean. We go fi uh, 500 milliliters every five to 10 minutes, and then you optimize both the vent, the, uh, the ionotropes, and, and whatever else I guess you can. Uh, and then you take kind of cereal gases, tracking lactate, and uh, seeing if you're getting more acidotic or whatnot. Uh, never touch the sweep, ever. Um, I will say probably once a year I have some sort of surgeon telling me to come down on the sweep and FiO2 when you're on VA ECMO. And it is difficult when you're at a center where the majority of ones that you do are VV ECMO, uh, but it is something that you always have to uh, identify. <laughs> So just classic termination, this is how we do it. Uh, we decrease, 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 500, making sure everything's fine. Once we get to two liters, uh, we sit there for eight hours. You can keep the anticoagulation at where it's at at this point. Um, after eight hours, let's say everything seems to be okay, then you will increase the, the uh, anticoagulation, and then you will uh, you'll increase the anticoagulation and uh, be able to start going down again. We use an ACT of about 200 to 250. Uh, 250. I know a lot of people use anti-10As now, uh, or we use a PTT of 60. Uh, one thing that should be noted is if you use bivalrudin, you need to switch to a different uh, anticoagulant, essentially. We give heparin even if they have hit in that scenario because it's such a short amount of time that you don't want it to clot off because bivalrudin is proteolytic. Um, so just Continuing on, we decrease, decrease, decrease. Uh, every 10 minutes, we go a little bit lower, lower. And uh, once we deem that we can get off uh, ECMO, which is probably around 500 cc's per minute, uh, what we do is clamp, cut, and then flush. And what I mean by that is we just clamp, we cut the line. What we'd usually do, the next thing says preserve the circuit, we'll just put a can uh, connector in to allow uh, for reuse if we need to. And then uh, the flushing scenario, I kind of just did this at our... our facility, but just showing you how to flush out a, a cannula. You keep either a stopcock or you keep, um, a lot of times they don't have a, like a stopcock on it, so you'll have to just use the end of the cannula. But either way, you're just going to open, you're going to burp it, and then you're going to push that fluid forward so that there's no blood in, in the cannula and it won't clot. Usually we use hep saline, so that uh, adds a little non-clotting. We do that every 30 minutes but I have been at facilities where they do it every five minutes to 10 minutes. Um, and that's so that you don't have any sort of clot happening on the cannula. Um, and then the other scenario is, is weaning with a bridge. So like I told you earlier, we have uh, bridges in our PED circuits, but we don't in our adult circuits. So uh, the adult circuits, we do the classic way where we kind of just come down and increase our anticoagulation. Uh, but the weaning with the bridge, we actually, uh, this is for our PEDs, patients and it's, it's beneficial because you just use less volume and they're more likely to go back on. Um, you can see the little arrows to just show you the, the directional flow of the blood going through the bridge but it's also going to the patient. We keep a flow probe right here on the, uh, I guess it would be distal, so distal to the bridge to know exactly what we're giving to the patient. Um, and so you clamp proximal to the bridge and then you flush that cannula out, you do the other side and then you clamp distal. And it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, there's no need for increase in anticoagulation because you have this bridge and you've flushed out whatever you need. And if you have to go back on, you just open the stopcocks and you're good to go again. It's super simple, um, but then you have to deal with the bridge. So kind of bittersweet. Uh, and that's pretty much everything. I hope it was somewhat helpful. Hope you got a couple things from it. Um, 